Um, all right, so we have a workshop to get to, everyone. If none of you have been around for this type of workshop, I hope that you'll enjoy it. I will need your help because there are some dice rolls that are required to make the setting for our adventure. If you are an aspiring dungeon master, you're looking for a way to say, eh, I, I don't want just another, uh, you know, Western European, you know, generic, uh, you know, medieval fantasy. And there's nothing wrong with running in that. My worlds have been much the same. But, you know, you want to try something different or you're like, well, I get it. I could go with, um, you know, I could go with Western Europe or I can go for like a feudal Japan or um, some people are kind of sassy and they go for a Mesoamerican setting. That's pretty cool, too. Um, yeah, <laughs> admitting you you need help is the first step. 12 sided guy. I need help. Uh, not with roles. Actually, there's going to be some stuff on Discord. Uh, there are some things around the channel that I could use help with. And uh, so I would be looking for those who are able to consistently provide the type of help I'm looking for. Uh, and and uh, hey, good morning to you, Fi. Fi, you have all of these cute emotes uh, that you keep sharing with us in chat. And my goodness, um, th that's another adorable one. So thank you for that and good morning to you. Um, so yeah, uh, let's... If we're familiar with a setting, we may be tempted to default to it. And we could be familiar with it because we've, you know, we've learned history. Or we're from a particular region. You live in the desert, you might run a lot of desert-themed content. Uh, you live in an equatorial uh, state or country, you might have a lot of equatorial adventures. You could describe it. Uh, you could describe it more in depth. And so these are, these are inbuilt biases that we have which are fine it's a part of existing we are i i say this not in an accusing fashion though i think many tend to run with it to the extreme we all have biases we have biases against uh foods that we like against the company we like to keep doesn't mean the person's a terrible human being you just have a preference you are you could have a bias for a particular brand of car uh, maybe because you just know it's reliable and you've always stuck with it. Maybe because you have family members uh, that work for the company. You know, so we have these and they're, they're called... Uh, another name for things like this is called an availability heuristic. H-E-U-R-I-S-T-I-C. An availability heuristic. It is a mechanism that we use in order... It acts as kind of a shortcut or a reference so that our brain can make judgment calls for survival as we have been developed to do we can make judgment calls quickly that are going to enhance our judgment and our survivability because we have to make a call do we uh, do we fight do we flight you know think of something why do we associate the color yellow with uh with a uh, warning color or caution Take a look at nature. You know, take a look at why green and blue tends to be calming. And so when people use those colors, our minds, through this availability heuristic, we have a bias towards a color. We have a bias towards uh, a setting. Maybe we've always played elves. All of our characters have been elves. We're one of those. We're one of those filthy, uh, disgusting people who like elves. <laughs> That's a whole other fun side argument in a in another in another realm. Uh, <laughs> and then you have those who like elves, and then there are those who like elves and those who hunt elves. Ah, anime reference. Uh, where even the elven community goes, if you don't have uh, you know if you don't have uh, you know knife you know like long like foot long blade like bowie knife ears then you are not a true elf lover and others just like the cute little petite points so we all have these um yeah hot colors back off heat danger uh things that might that might be barren uh or or not survivable there's no water and such um and uh 
it's uh, our randomization process helps remove these references and challenges us just like we all challenge each other to be to think differently to be better people or even if it ends up confirming yeah you know what i don't really like uh cajun food never cared for it you know what i gave my friend's gumbo a try still don't like it maybe it's the gooey okra maybe it's just the spice mix i, I can't handle it maybe i don't know you you have bad memories associated with it and just psychologically you know the the best chef in the world can make you some hot jambalaya but if it reminds you of that really crappy time where something was going on it's gonna sour it'll sour you it'll sour your taste so by using the randomization process that we have so far in the workshop and to build our characters which is going to lead to our settlement we can strip away the our own quick go-to's and challenge ourselves to connect dots that maybe we never have before. Uh, now, you if any of you were around, and if not, hey, here they are. Over the past couple nights, we built four randomized characters. And from there... And uh, Macabre Derek, I don't know if you're still out there. Uh, but if you are, you would be very proud of us. Because not only... Not only did we do a traditional Matty Morgs... A party sheet where we looked at the entire party and we uh, and we we set them together they're all level four we're comparing apples to apples uh, so while we built four individuals we then brought them together as a party for some references to us as a dungeon master to know what are their strengths and weaknesses what are opportunities and threats the whole role play exercise is we want to create an adventure that is going to be fun and memorable for the friends and family we're playing with. And then we finish that up. Um, we finish that up by creating a relationship map. And now this is not a complete map as I was going through and showing the methodology. And, you know, we, we talked about the characters and the data. But you can see where we were starting to form... Oh, what happened, Bronson? You wanted chips and salsa, but uh, did you have one and not the other? So you can see we took the data that step by step, none of this has been onerous. None of this has been complex. One piece of data at a time, a random roll, a thought, a random roll, a thought. We put that together. And now we have a visual representation where we see some of these connections. Hey, PV, welcome. It's uh, good to see you back again. This is awesome Session Zero stuff, too. There's nothing saying you can't sit down with your players and have everyone draw it out. Because you will find so many connections. Pardon. You'll find so many connections that you may not have seen otherwise, even if the players were creating characters themselves. Through, if, if you prefer text, if you prefer drawings, these are all ways... Hey, Draconic Gamer, uh... Good uh, morning, good late evening, good early morning to you. Uh, Hark says, I had that problem with sausages. I finally found out that I can't stand eating it due to... Oh, the fennel. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, so just these little seeds. And I, I get it. I mean, I, I, I like fennel. Now, if it's overly fenneled, yeah, I agree with you, Hark. But some people just have different taste tolerances. And so you got to... Even if it's not for a medical, like an allergenic reason... You just got to look for sausages that don't have fennel seeds. Uh, you had neither. Yeah, but they don't have all the... Oh, they don't have the good choices. <laughs> now, Bronson, you were just getting a friendly a-woo. No, yeah, she wasn't patronizing you. It, it was a, it was a, a sympathizing a-woo. Cause you're you're upset. Step by step. Ooh baby, I want to get to you, girl. -er 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 -er. <laughs> so 
song references, lyrics pop up here and there. It's a part of D and D uh, and having some table talk. Why? Oh my! Did uh, that was weird. For you all watching, did my stream glitch out at all? Because I, I just, I don't know. The software seemed to have a, uh, no? All right. Hey, we're still alive then. No, my, my slobs just kind of like, I don't know. Took a second and derped out. Anyway, well, we're still alive, everyone. Hi, I'm Manny Morgs. Welcome to the workshop. So there, you can see there's no stress. We opened our minds to possibilities. And by creating these four characters, a little bit at a time, we now have a solid foundation where we can continue to build a world now in which these characters are connected. Meaning that your players who are piloting them, your friends and family at your table, virtual or otherwise, will have a, a role to play in the world. But are any of us really alive, or are we NPCs in someone else's game? <sighs> Philosophized. No glitch? Alright, well then I'm... I'm glad it was, I guess, just the software display. But it just, like, flickered blackout for a second. Based on this, and you don't have to know the characters, we can narrate or we can, we can access inspiration... Though, as we're going through the process, if ideas are forming in your head, you are welcome to share them in chat. And coming from an outside uh, opinion, even if you didn't have an interaction with the characters, then perhaps you have an idea that works very well that we hadn't considered because we did uh, we did lose some focus and, uh, and drifted elsewhere. All right. Let me open up the redemption here. We have some folks uh, who wanted to roll uh, specifically. And uh, we have the tavern name, the form of government. Uh, Cyart, uh, I don't, Cyart, are you still here? If so, you said that you wanted to roll, but did you have a preference? And then Raz wants to roll for the dominant race. Okay. Well, then I'll tell you what. Uh, Sayart, you can get us going. Uh, and we're going to start with the terrain types. And this is a reference now. In the player's handbook, there are eight different biomes that are represented. There's a ninth, but it's kind of it, uh, through backgrounds. There are mechanics associated with these eight terrain types for both rangers and druids. Meaning, if you use these eight as a guideline, especially if you have someone in your party who's a ranger or a druid, you are going to help immerse them and ensure that their characters can bring their knowledges and, and have fun with the setting. And, and they would care about the setting. Uh, th there's, you know, if you have a friend who says, yeah, I have this swamp, uh, I have this swamp druid, and another friend goes, yeah, and I have a mountain druid, and despite that, you say, all right, everyone, we're going to play in the desert. I hope you're ready. We're going to go level 1 to 20. It'll probably take a year and a half. Okay. Oh, I guess we can work with this. Uh, you know, maybe we'll find something. So there are some considerations for your players uh, in terms of uh, what you're presenting as well. Because some mechanics do rely on... Uh, species of, uh, of people or animals, of terrain, um, or even of just experience of the, the player who might be able to bring something. You get someone who lived in the Rocky Mountains or the Appalachian Mountains, and you're running a mountain-style game, and you know that they love hiking and whatever, even though it's a meta consideration for the setting, they could maybe translate their own experience. And Do you know how, do you know how involved that person's going to feel at your table? Hey, Raven. Um, <coughs> pardon me. I have one monster, <coughs> one monster menagerie, one, two Volos, four Tomb of Anni <coughs> Annihilations, 
And uh, six, Descent into Avernus. Apparently I forgot how to drink soda. Now, one of our characters we made was a ranger. And as a DM, if you have a ranger in your party, as much as like PCs are like, uh, ranger, that's a meme, way, 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 worst class 5e. Um, rangers can do so much mechanically and to bring the world alive because they are, they are a product of their environment. And rangers can help out immensely to explore, to navigate, to fight things, uh, and be effective combatants so they're not a meme fighter class. Uh, am I going to do Wildemount streams? Uh, that is going to depend. So base, yes. Uh, that is going to depend on the books that I have and that are available. And I don't know if I'm going to do Wildemount the first week it comes out. I might give it a week to simmer. And, uh, and then we could go over that content together. I still technically haven't gone over Eberron. I am literally the worst. Uh, we did Eberron in the PDF form, though, for Morgrave Miscellany and the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the first one, also. The favored terrain of our ranger was Forest. So... I think it's safe to say we can have a forest biome. Now, why two? It was my choice. You as a DM might want three. But if we have two different uh, general environments, it will help diversify the area. It will mean that there are, are set pieces. As a DM, you can compartmentalize your narration, your areas. And so, Sayar, what I'd like you to do is with math rock spot type exclamation point roll space 1 d 7 because we're skipping over forest roll a d7 for me in chat you rolled a 2 so we have a forest and we have a coast and I'll tell you all what I'll tell you what it's funny how this is working out, because we have two turtles in the party. Now, I wasn't going to consider turtles as needing any particular, uh, you know, because turtles actually aren't really amphibious. They can hold their breath for an hour, but they don't have a swim speed. You know, it's like many tortoises. Uh, they're more land-based. They, they can get around on land. Of course, they need water, but... So there you go. Raz says it writes itself. M-M-I-W-I -I for Iwi. We have Owos and Uwus, and here we have Iwis. <clears throat> As a Canadian, that sounds like a holy alien combination. <laughs> now here's the thing, 12-sided guy. What if in our coast we have an area that has like our realm's highest record for the difference between high tide and low tide. And now, I don't know. Something like that might sound completely, uh, completely dumb. Nothing like that can exist in real life um, as a place having the record for the highest high tide and lowest low tide difference, or the, the greatest difference. But, eh, whatever. So, Cyart, thank you for helping to kick us off here. What, and you see, look, I, th there's all sorts of stuff. Like We could even, I mean, let's say that the place has a lot of uh, harsh weather. Uh, you could even name it uh, something, I don't know. This is, this is ridiculous. Like, no one would actually ever name a place like this. Uh, you could name a place like Lightning Bay. And, you know, it, it's a dumb, it's a dumb, meme sounding fantasy name. But sure, we could have a Lightning Bay. We're all imaginative. A place like that would never actually exist, but, you know. To Avernus, please. The, by the way, the uh, that that the, the, this is very obvious sarcasm. I mean, kappa 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 for the things that I'm saying here. And uh, to Avernus, oh, all right, Raven. Uh, if you can wait until we're finished with the worksheet, I will pop those Avernus for you. 
Yeah, for those of you who don't, uh... <laughs> Now, we had a role for the form of government. Now we're going to switch from the player's handbook because your setting should involve your players. Let's go to the, um, let's go to the uh, Dungeon Master's Guide. And, whoop, I went, there we go. We had uh, Bronson. Bronson, will you please roll a D100 and uh, tell us what kind of government our society has. And yep, no problem, Raven. You rolled a 72. We have a monarchy. Well, hey, we generated a courtier, so I guess we don't need to do uh, uh, some mental gymnastics to still find a way to make that work. Uh, uh, so we have a monarchy. And for all of you out there, if you're not sure what is a gentrocracy, uh, or I'm sorry, a gerontocracy, a guarantee. That's what they use down in Louisiana. What is feudalism? Pardon me. Soda, right? What's a confederacy or a bureaucracy? The DMG is going to supply you with good brief answers that you can then uh, look at an encyclopedia or a dictionary. You can find other examples in fact or even in fiction. So, for example, when it talks about an oligarchy, it references the free city of Greyhawk which is in the Greyhawk setting, uh, is an oligarchy composed of various faction leaders with the Lord Mayor as its figurehead. Now, we have a monarchy. Now, pff, that's dumb. What what country would ever use a monarchy? Come on, am I right? Kappa, kappa, kappa. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> a single hereditary sovereign wears the crown. Unlike the autocrat, the monarch's powers are limited by law, and the ruler serves as the head of a democracy, feudal state, or militocracy. The Kingdom of Brayland in Eberron, uh, or in the Eberron campaign setting, has both a parliament that makes laws and a monarch who enforces them. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, village elders, exactly. Um, you know, so, so village elders, uh, city fathers, um, there are some other, um, there's some other, uh, sort of names for that station. All right, Katniss. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably punishable by death there. So cool, we have a monarchy. This is giving us all things to think about for the region. Now, let's start, let's go to mapping our wilderness. And I personally like to involve at least three notable features. You know, beyond if there's a mountain or if there's a forest. You know, those are natural features. That, that's a part of the terrain. What about marks that have been left on the land by the inhabitants? If not the current ones, then the past. The DMG has you covered if you need inspiration, and we're going to roll for two monuments and a weird locale. Hey, we live in a weird, um, in a magical world. Let's have a, a kind of a supernatural uh, consideration as well. And what's beautiful about this system in the DMG or just through how we interpret it, you can have three major features. Well, actually, here, I'll challenge you. Think about the city in which you live. Where, wherever it is. I don't care if you live in rural, uh, in rural Iowa. I don't care if you live in a big city like Miami, Florida. I don't care if you're Eastern European or if you live in the Andes Mountains. You could be in a in a, a small uh, a small village, or you could be in a major metropolis. Can you think of three three notable things about your city? Could be a statue, could be a museum, it could be um, you know some other piece of art. Just three things that people would know where you live by. Could be a notable farm or a, a species of animal that is just native there. Now, what about your county? or the equivalent of your county where you live. Can you still name three things? And maybe the things in your city don't qualify for that next scale. But can you still name three things that exist in your county? Now zoom out. 
Can you name three things in your state or province or equivalent that are notable for where you live? You know, some states are known for a natural feature. You know, Grand Canyon are known for a man-made feature, the Statue of Liberty. There's some places that are rumored to be, uh, to just be rampant with snake pits. If you want to believe that such a place exists, just snake pits everywhere, filled with snakes. Everyone knows about it. It's a feature. Congratulations. Welcome. We have snakes. And then can you zoom out even further? And does your country have three uh, in, Massachu in uh, Massachusetts? Sorry, Farfel, you, you, you probably hear mispronunciations often. In Massachusetts, we've got a boat and a rock, and the boat's not even here right now. <laughs> it, it'll still count. No, uh, it it's, uh, uh, you know, the, it could even be one of the cities itself. You know, you have Boston. I'm sure people are like, well, like, you know, maybe we can, like, carve that out or something. But... So at all these levels, we can still think of three major things. So let's represent that here. And if you want more, this is your world. Uh, you take this worksheet and run with it. Uh, so for a monument, I don't see anyone that has... Oh, you know, Exhausted Dragon, you, you wanted a roll here. Exhausted Dragon, will you give me a d20 roll, please? We'll go to like a, a city sounding soundtrack in the background. All right, Exhausted Dragon gives us a two. Ooh, a plundered burial mound or pyramid. Uh, actually, here, let's differentiate the two. Uh, Farful, will you please roll a d4? And on a an odd number, it's a burial mound. On an even number, it's a pyramid. Exclamation point roll space 1d4. Rolled a 2, so it's a plundered pyramid. And this place has another feature. Uh, Derek, uh, would you be so kind as to roll a d20 to give us another feature of this area? Rolls a six. An intact obelisk etched with a warning, historical lore, dedication, or religious iconography. So we have an intact obelisk with... And then uh, let's have 12-sided guy. Can you roll a d4 in chat, please? Exclamation point roll space 1d4. Three. Uh, warning, historic, a uh, dedication, an intact obelisk or uh, some some similar structure uh, with a dedication. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here, for this is where all things are left behind. That can also welcome people to your city. <laughs> In fairness, it's a it, it's a warning. It's you know, you're you're not trying to hide anything. <laughs> now, we need a weird locale. We need a weird locale. Uh and so can I have let's see. Who is hanging out Raz? Raz, can you give me a D20 roll please? Let's get weird with Raz. Uh, it's spray painted on my city's welcome sign. Wait, really? It happened two weeks. Oh, oh my gosh! Do you have a photo of that, Derek? 
Or maybe if it was a news story, I might be able to find it, unless you had one uh, yourself, but, jeez. Oh, <laughs> well, there's a sense of humor to that, I suppose. <laughs> you rolled a 13. That, oh, Farfel's asking the... Farfel's getting right to the... Uh, now, here's the question. Are we going to get a winky face from Derek? <laughs> 13, a wrecked ship, which might be nowhere near the water. A wrecked ship, which may be nowhere near the water. Hey, Bronson! Well, I hope you're going to be in a better mood now. You won't be hangry for chips and salsa. <laughs> Next up, we need to consider... We need to consider our... <laughs> A wrecked ship? That sounds rigged to me. Wow. <laughs> We need to consider some things. For instance, uh, how many how many races live in your area? In many fantasy worlds, we have a plethora. The player's handbook offers nine. Although, if you look in the player's handbook, there's really only four, like four core races. Human, dwarf, elf, and halfling. The other five races are like, well, if you want to play with them, then we're offering these as options. So I, I don't know if any of you ever caught that in the player's handbook. There's only four. There's like four fantasy races to consider, uh, in the uh, in the player's handbook. There, uh, the other five are just sort of like, yeah, you know, let's have some fun and dabble around. It's not that they're broken by any means. I, I think mechanically you'd find you'd people find or you'd find people that would say like, oh, Dragonborn are mechanically the worst race ever. Whatever. I mean, <laughs> it's up to you. It's your character. Um. But, uh, so think about this. Now, we have an interesting clue. We have an interesting clue because of all of the... Well, here, I'll, I'll even I'll bring this up as well. I want you to check this out. There are 50 races, not including sub-races. There are 50 races that exist, including ones from D&D &D time. Of those 50, we ended up with two turtles, a Kenku, and a, uh, I was about to say Tabaxi, that we pulled those earlier, and a Centaur. Two turtles, a Kenku, and a Centaur. Well, if these people exist, presumably they live in the region that we're going to be adventuring. Or, you know, you could say, well, maybe it's an all turtle city. There's nothing wrong, even in a fantasy game, where predominantly one species lives. And, and neighbors from far away or close by could visit. But maybe they're not a, you know, any sort of a statistical population. Though, why don't we take this as a prompt that races like humans and elves don't exist in this campaign world? I mean, why don't we just, like, there's a, a campaign setting that came out on uh, Kickstarter uh, called uh, Humblewood. Called Humblewood. And there's no humans, there's no dwarves. I mean, there's placeholders, but everyone is playing, you know, animal uh, animals of some kind. Uh, different burbs, uh, or, yeah, it's uh, burbs and then some, uh, some various mammals, uh, like... Uh, uh, raccoons and, and such. Uh, deer. They have some deer folk as well. Uh, life is a little slower there. So why don't we take this as an inspiration and say, alright, well, if we know... If, if the player's handbook... Well, let's put it this way. If the player's handbook has nine races, and maybe all the adventurers could be outsiders... 
You know, it just so happens we have two turtles and whatever. Why don't we come up, like, with the player's handbook, we come up with, uh, with some races that might exist here. And so we have, uh, let's see, we have an Aarakocra, we have Avens, we have Bunny Folk, we have Centaurs, uh, Dragonborn? Unless that's too human for you, in which case we could skip that over and go to uh, Lizard Folk. Uh, we have Entithropes. We have Florins, which are a plant person. We have uh, Kenku. We have Lizard Folk. We have Loxodons. Would Merfolk be, uh, you know, too humanoid? Because it's not really, it's kind of partial animal. I don't know. We have a centaur. Um, we have Mer so we'll put Merfolk, we'll put Minotaurs, Nagas, uh, what else, Shifters, perhaps? A Simic Hybrid could be interesting, because you are, I mean, you're kind of made of animal parts. A Siren... Tabaxi. Uh, Tortles, of course. Whoops. That was my computer. And uh, maybe Yonti Purebloods as snake people. If there are no humans, what do people think the top half of a centaur is? That's a very good question. Uh, now, we know that centaurs exist because we had a character that was one. Uh, but we could describe, um, our second question, can there be no horses? So if our, if our, the, if we take the broad definition, oh, you think furbolgs would fit? And gnolls? Um, unfortunately, gnolls don't have, uh, I mean, we could reflavor it, but for, for this exercise, I don't have an easy access to it. Um, oh, grung? That's right. Whoops. The Grung should be on here, but they're not. It is a D&D &D time race. Well, I guess we'll just put Grung. So a centaur would be a cent it would just be its own creature. Uh, but you can just take the the inspiration as uh, you know, we know it to be half human, half horse, when a centaur is a representation of a humanoid a humanoid part and a quadruped part. That is a very good question, 12-sided. Yeah, as player characters. So if we open this up, uh, and we know that we have... Uh, I don't know, let's say that uh, there are... Yeah, a turtle tar. You know, a centaur is in... If we're, if we're playing with the mechanics, we can reflavor the centaur to be what we'd like it to be. Derek, thanks for hanging out with us tonight. It's always a pleasure having you. Uh, I, I appreciate your, uh, uh, I, I also appreciate your, uh, your shared story and, uh, your little bit of a wink and a nod there, <laughs> uh, but be well, my friend, uh, I'll see you around. So yeah, we already know that we have, uh, da -da -da, where are you? Centaur is number seven. Oh, cripes. How do I get... You know what? I reduce the uh, the quick... Ah, oh, there we go. Alright. So we already know we have uh, centaurs. We know that we have turtles. I... Stick around. There we go. And we also have Kenku. So what are maybe... Maybe three other... Uh, now, uh, here's the question too, Farful. Would the torso come up through the middle of the shell? Or would or would it come out the front, kind of like a turtle, uh, a turtle's head? 
but wouldn't that be interesting if the torso came up through the shell and it almost looked like a, a big like um uh like a whalebone or a buttressed skirt so a person's going around on four turtle feet but has the upper part of a of a human or a humanoid yeah maybe the humans uh are uh, are ancient yeah look at these unevolved creatures no defensive measures no feathers no fur uh, only, only two arms and two legs, or something similar. So why don't we throw in the possibility of, uh, let's say, uh, let's say three others. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Uh, so, Golden, will you please roll a seventeen-sided die? Shade Mage, can you please roll a 16-sided die? And then can I have... Uh, who else is hanging out with us here? Uh, is there anyone out there that hasn't rolled yet and would like to? So Golden has a 17 and got a 15. So if that was 17... 16, 15 is 41. All right, uh, you, please roll a 15-sided die in chat. Uh, oh, we got the tabaxi. So the tabaxi are a possible uh, race for consideration uh, that lives in the area. Uh... Oh, Shade Mage has a 14. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 is a 40. And those were Sirens. And then uh, you ended up rolling a 2. And so that are that's Avens. Interesting. So we have two different flying type races. We have the Kenku that cannot fly. We then have... Uh, these uh, centaurs as we want to envision them and uh, turtles and tabaxis so after determining uh, after determining the type of people that can live in our world since it, it seemed like a cool prompt that sure we're playing a D&D &D game where no one can be a human no one can be a variant human no one can be a Shatterkai elf uh, no one can be a war forged uh, or anything along those lines. Um, we we natively, maybe we never thought about doing this before, but because we trusted our friends to make a character they want to play, they came together and it turns out that this is a type of world that they would love to play in. Now that we have this information, we can come over here and there was a role for the dominant race in this in this region raz will you please roll a d what was it one two three a d6 whoops that's my headset i think i jiggled the usb cable Rolled a two. And so our number seven race, centaurs. Centaurs are the dominant. Well, maybe that's how our little kid got such an important job. There's a manga called A Centaur's Life that's very interesting. And um, it, uh, it actually goes into... It has its own like natural history that explains how centaurs came about as an evolution of uh of mankind uh it's 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 a neat one it's a neat one to read so our dominant race are the centaur now what about the minority race and we haven't determined is it dominant in terms of uh economic power political power is it simply dominant minority because of the amount of either you know, you could have a minority be the rulers because they're the ones that have the most 
money or influence or it's just uh maybe the the dominant race considers these rarer ones to just be sacred or something along those lines uh so we have the centaurs and then who who has not rolled yet Oh, hey, Sovreg. Uh, Sovreg, can you roll a D5 in chat for me? Exclamation point, roll space, 1D5. Uh, we're developing the populace, you. Yeah. And you rolled a 2. So we already had this one taken, so that's why it was a D5, because we already had that one taken. So the minority race is 26, and those are the Kenku. Well, there we, so I guess our I guess our turtles might have been uh, exiles or or they're rarer or they just live in like the next uh, the next county over kind of a thing. And our adventurers are here for some other reason, which uh, which could work out well. They have the most carrots. Oh, OK. Oh, Raven, you're still here. Uh, I can call on you for a roll. Uh, I thought you were I thought you were out and about. Now, what is the race relations between these two? We can certainly sit down and imagine it if we wish, but if we want to exclude our own biases, our own experiences with how communities get along. Oh, uh, well, you think you could do a if you can do a role, can you tell your talk to text? then to do exclamation point roll space 1d20 to give us our race relations exhausted dragon do, if you have a second before you go to bed i can squeeze in another roll for you gotcha don't worry about it then uh exhausted can you give me a d20 roll before bed and you live up to your name of being a, a tired durgan after fav you had an int you had a fun customer Hopefully that is actually you had a fun customer, not a fun customer. Yeah, uh, just give me a a four. Oh, there's harmony. There's harmony between the centaur and the kenku. Thank you. All right, now get to bed. Go on, get you varmint. Um, after Fav, if you have a second, can you give us a D twenty roll in chat? Uh, if you're busy, then uh. Uh, if you're busy, then I understand. Yeah, it's exhausted dragon brings harmony. Uh, <laughs> okay, no problem, After Fav. Well, hey, you know what? So After Fav, you had an interesting interaction. And through that, I mean, whether or not this customer, you know, changed your heart or your mind or your spirit, you had an interesting interaction and you can use this experience in your life, IRL or at the tabletop. Oh, you've been a, a, a lurking dragon is the lightning dragon. Lightning dragon, what is the ruler status? Remember, we have a monarchy, but what's happening in the monarchy? Go ahead and give us a d20 roll to find out. All right, and we get a one, respected, fair, and just. He's been giving us the light by which we read by. I like that interpretation. Uh, now I'm imagining how difficult diplomacy would be with Kenku. <laughs> we're world building, huh? These are things to consider if we're playing Kenku by the book. Now, this, this area has a notable trait. And uh, can I have... Uh, Farful, can you give me a notable trait with a d20 roll? Rolled an 8. It is the headquarters of a powerful family or guild. 
Well, you know what they say, it writes itself. I mean, not only is it a monarchy, which, you know, supports powerful families kind of intrinsically by its existence, we have a character who rolled as a background the Is It Guild. Now, we're not playing in Ravnica, but we can take that as inspiration uh, that it the headquarters of a powerful guild exists in this region. And this is also going to mean that when we look at our party, did you see how many of them had persuasion? You know, if we're talking about a monarchy, if we're talking about uh, a guild that is overruling probably a lot of commerce and a lot of daily aspects, and one of them is a guild member, for the placeholder of whatever the Izzets would be. Now that's a notable trait. This place in particular is known for something else. And you, I would like to call on you once more. Can you give me a D20 roll to help us determine what is this place known for? Rolled a seven. It's known... F oh, there's hordes of beggars. I wonder if the beggars wouldn't be the, uh, the turtles or some of the other species that might be coming to this town if it's, uh, if it's, uh, very influential. Or, or the beggars could be interpreted. Uh, there are many religions that will send monks, whether they're Western or Eastern, into the city uh, to be humble and to uh, beg for food or alms. All right, Raven, give me a D20 roll. Quick, before whatever your red light is up or something. Uh, for the current calamity. So there's a lot of beggars here, uh, which, you know, could be from a lot of different reasons. Uh, it could just be a lifestyle. It could be religious. It could be economic. That's fine, Raven. I just need a d20 roll. Darn goblins in their beggarish ways. I've seen what happens when goblins go to taverns. That's right, Lightning. Exactly. No rolls or fails in world building. Good, good sentence there, Hark. Do cobblers exist? How many of these races actually wear shoes? Would they need uh, a horseshoer's guild? Uh, do standard centaurs usually use horseshoes? Farful, you are... You are... You're doing a good job of asking the relevant questions. That's, oh no! Drizkill, you didn't hear anything. Don't worry, there's no goblins here. Alright, we got an 18. The current calamity facing this place... Uh-oh, there's a scandal that's threatening powerful families. You know, I'd like to imagine that if, if clothing is invented, even by animalistic races... Um, of course, I mean, if, if you want to play and just say clothing doesn't exist because it's all kind of, you know, they don't, they don't need it for various biological or uh, cultural purposes, you can run that game as well. It doesn't have to be intrinsically, you know, going above a PG-13 rating either. Um, but, uh, you know, these are questions to ask. If we have invented clothes, and we as humans invented shoes, even though we don't technically need shoes, we develop calluses. You know, would centaurs, would centaurs develop shoes that could help them run faster, or uh, keep their hooves from splitting, or... Uh, or, you know, trying to reduce the wear and tear. Or even just for fashion. You know, we're talking about our centaur rogue uh, wearing rubber horseshoes so he can sneak around a little bit better. I'm glad it's just for world building and not campaigning. Uh, can you can you explain the difference or what that means, you? Oh, gotcha. All right. Yeah. Well, still, low rolls are role play opportunities, you. 
if you look at rolling low as a role play opportunity, uh, that you will uncover so many more opportunities that perhaps you might resign yourself to miss otherwise. Yeah, they might wear clothes for utilitarian. For even the um, here. If you all remember the turtles from earlier, you know the cape. You you know just because you can hold your breath doesn't mean you like having the rain on you. The the these could be prayer beads for a monk. You know this sash is holding an alchemical jug. Even for practical purposes, if not for purposes of uh, modesty or hygiene. You know, because meanwhile, we have turtles wearing clothes, and we have werebears uh, that might wear a ribbon in his beard. But other than that, I mean, that booty dough. You know what? Uh, you know what horse socks would look like, Parful? They'd look like those, um, like those leggings uh, from, uh, like, uh, that, uh, like from the '80s, that would like go from ankle to knee, and they would just be sort of like a, a scrunchy material. That's kind of what's coming to mind. <laughs> like those athletic, uh, like calf warmers or something. Yeah, from the workout videos. Exactly. Can centaurs climb walls? Um, yes, not very well. And ultimately, the catch-all to that is DM discretion. Leg warmers. There we go. Thank you, Afterfall. Leg warmers. That's what it is. Now, we don't have a, a name yet for the town or the region, and that's fine. Uh, you'll find in most places, west or east, there is some kind of a, a major religious building. Uh, however, even in this uh, randomly rolled guide, um, it could be... Uh, it, it doesn't have to be uh, overtly religious, or even still attended. You know, but can you think in your own hometown, is there... You know, what is the big temple or church or uh, mosque or whatever else shrine that exists in your area? You might be able to think of it because a lot of people in town go to it, whether or not you do. Centaurs doing calisthenics? Far Then Farful, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta see a centaur's life. I think they actually made it into an anime also, but uh, the manga as well. It actually has a bunch of like day-to-day -day stuff. It, it, like, shows the interior of cars. And so the centaurs actually, like, sit on a bench. So on a, it's a long bench. And the seat belts are, like, a floor-to-ceiling rigging system. Um, you know, so their upper half is just like they're, they're riding. But the horse half, they kind of, like, curl their, their legs under them like a horse would when it's sitting down or, or laying down. And so it's really just a bench underneath them. It's a cool concept. And think about this, as human beings, let's say, let's say everything else the same with human beings, except our knees were on the front or on the back. What would toilets look like if as human beings, our knees were on the back and nothing else changed? But yeah, Centaur's life gets into the minutia of a modern day setting uh, with, uh, it's not just centaurs, there's other, uh, there's some other, uh, animal type people as well, but, um, and it gets into a society where racism exists between the bestial, uh, races, uh, where there's war, where there's, um, exchange students, where there's commerce, where there's just day-to-day -day life of little kids and teenagers growing up. There's a couple parts that if you have someone over your shoulder, they might go, what are you looking at? But, you know, such as is in daily life, but the entirety of that content isn't, uh, it's not meant to be a, uh, in a, an adult read. There's just things that happen in life where, you know, interactions happen. No, it's called a centaur's life. I'd recommend it. It's really cool. If you love world building or thinking of cultures, 
Um, you know, something, a, a big part that it plays, uh, there's a, a, there are snake people. There's a race of snake people that exist. And snakes, they, they can't smile. In fact, uh, this is extrapolated even to, um, uh, you know, to lizard folk. You know, I, well, I don't know if you Chunkus can do this. Um, snakes can't smile. So every time this, uh, this character smiles, she distends her jaw and looks like she's going to eat someone. Because she doesn't have eyelids to, you know, ha ha ha. And all she can do is just open her mouth. So you tell her a joke, she finds it funny, she goes, ha 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 ha. And it looks completely crazy and off-putting. But that's because the culture has to get to know each other. Because of the, the, the differences in the physiology. Uh, so, a religious building in town. Um, let's have... Uh, Raz, can you give me a d20 roll, please? You roll a 17. Ah, so the religious building is actually more of a library. Library dedicated to religious study. Now, we can interpret this as it's a library with a massive section on religion. It could be a monastery with a publicly accessible library. Uh, this could be a, uh, let's see, a monastery. It was a... Uh, or just like a big public library. Oh, it could also be... Um, uh, it could be a seminary school. It could be a, a religion school. And so we it, it's a university where maybe you could learn about nature and, and uh, more, um, you know, uh, scientific teachings or other worldly teachings. However, if you go there, you're also going to get a religious education as well. So we can take the prompt as that too. And you know what works very well? Or religion is seen as learning. And just so you all know, if we want to go back and say it writes itself, we have two characters that have the acolyte background. Both of them have a have a problem with the hierarchy in their temple for branding them as heretics. We have a turtle and a Kenku. Who are both versed in religion for that acolyte background. Even though this is a result of a random roll after the fact, do you see how the process from everything we've done step by step can trickle back and pull everything together and make everything bind and cohesive and uh, uh, as a result of organic growth all right now hark i know you've been anxiously waiting for this one hark you wanted to generate the name of the tavern what is the what's the main place in town everyone goes to who's who needs information or a strong drink or whatever whatever we as dms need it to be this is the place to go to hark will you please roll 2d20 in chat Seven and twelve. This is the running spirit. The running spirit. Is that a centaur reference? Is that a reference to... Is there animosity uh, between uh, the ground-based races and then the avens and um, uh, sirens? Is the running spirit simply a euphemism for flowing alcohol? Because that's the place to go for it. 
is the running is the spirit the name of a river that goes out to the sea by which this city exists it's the spirit and it, it's a river that runs and this is a major place maybe uh you know in the background do you hear that that's a water mill use what's around you what if the big bar in town is a water mill that creates their own grains for their their alcohol and it uses the river so everything is uh i mean it's made as fresh as alcohol can be made fresh that said we can actually give uh we can give a twist as well what kind of a tavern is the running spirit and that could help us determine why it's called as such um, and so to finish this out, Raven, uh, or Proxy Raven, can you please roll a d20 and help us determine what kind of a tavern, what kind of a tavern is the running spirit? Yes, this is the Dungeon Master's Guide, Lightning Dragon. Rolled an 11. Oh, uh-oh, the plot thickens. This is a gathering place for a secret society. Uh, it, lightning, it's fine. Uh, we go over these exercises for this reason. And if you want other things like residences and building types, if you come up to... Or is it down? I think it's going to be down. Like, you have you have something like this, which is a good sketch. Or if you ever... Ah, here we go. So let's say that you use this dedicated page as a placeholder for a city in your environment. You go through and there's charts up above that you can randomly assign, you know, do people live in this house? Is this a warehouse? And if so, what kind? So you can use this as an example and there's plenty of others like it that you can simply put little numbers on it or you can, you know, look at a picture and have it come to life. And if you need inspiration, it's all right here, look. What kind of shop? So let's say right here on the corner. Right here on the corner is a corner shop. I don't know. Hark, roll a d20. You roll a 17. It's a tailor store. It's a tailor shop right on the corner. And if we know that there's a tailor shop here, whether or not we roll for every little thing, by simply putting a couple placeholders, much like we make our characters, well, what kind of a shop might be next to a tailor shop? Do they share things in common that they might be able to buy in bulk together and split it for their different stores? You know, does the tailor shop only make finished goods? And so next to it is a textile shop. If this is a tailor shop, what's this big building across the way right here? Is this a guild hall? Is this a is this a religious building? Is this actually the mayor of town's house so that he can look out over most of the rest of the town, thereby kind of indicating, well, if this is the mayor's mansion, then, you know, maybe the keep is for some guards, there's this back entrance. Uh, down here uh, might be a religious building or it could be a, a guild building So this might actually end up being the market district simply because we determined this one building right here. Oh What did I do? How is? What? 
How do I have a floating... What is... Do any of you know what's happening on my PDF here? Why I have this floating image? All I've been using is a mouse. I have no idea what happened. This is going to be annoying. Uh, but just by determining this one building, all of a sudden it seems like this is more of the, you know, executive or high-end mercantile branch. Then we can look at everything else. So over here, this is probably, like, is this residential? Maybe low income? Uh, back here, you know, this might be middle income. Uh, then we have a marketplace, but that's separating the two kind of a thing. It's a fancy inn. Lots of people in town come to buy the well-known clothing that's made in town. Yeah, I have no idea. Can I even... Does it zoom in if I zoom in? No, it's staying the same. I don't know why there's a little ghostly image of the cover. No, I can't even click on it. See? It clicks on the page behind it. See, oh, I can still highlight that. But if I highlight this, it goes through it. Wait, is this... Oh, edit PDF. No, do... Uh, no. No. No, it's clicking through. I have... I don't know. Well, I, I have the player's handbook open, yeah. But I'm in, the, I'm in my DMG. Oh, well. I'm not going to let it get me down. We are still... We're having fun. We're exploring this content. Now what we can do is with these rolls, we can look at what we have and consider, sure... Uh, we, we have an idea now that we have a harmonious region. There's a powerful guild. How is this going to work? Uh, and and how is it going to go between things? And what I want to do next is based off of these prompts as we're, as, as one as another way to visualize, just as we visualize the relationship map. Oh, look at that. Wait a minute. It's floating. It's floating on my screen. What the heck? I. Oh, all right. Well, I don't. I, I must have clicked something. I was only using my mouse. Uh. But anyway. Uh. So we have this information. I, I want to get up and take another break, and when we come back, we are going to go into da -da -da -da, paint, and we are going to map the region with a simple standard mouse, mouse pad, MS Paint, nothing fancy, nothing expensive, and uh, let's make a readable map that reflects this region and might give us even more ideas as a dungeon master. Because by sitting down and doing it, it allows your brain to just naturally process. Also, Raven. Uh, Raven, when we come back from the break, uh, if you are, if you're able to watch or listen along, I will open your boxes of Avernus. But anyway, give me at least five minutes, everyone, um, and uh, I'll be back soon. <laughs> 